Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hotland Mode and today on Hotland Mode we are getting into the New York Fashion Week review that you need to know. Now normally I do sort of stack all of my show reviews together but it's a little bit long and honestly we don't really have all that much to do with the coronavirus going on so I felt like people might be you know a little bit more antsy and it's easier for us to edit them this way when we send them out it's all fun everybody has a grand old time don't worry about it before we get any further into the show reviews if you guys are looking for a channel that talks about fashion the most fun sassy bitchy analytical way this is it you can go down below hit the subscribe button and turn on my post notifications I mean like what do you have to lose listen we're going through Miss Corona's experience so and if you guys are looking to see more from me you can follow me on any of my social medias linked down below and you can check out the fashion victims podcast that I do with my friend Darnell Jamal where we talk about the fashion news and gossip you need to know weekly so let's get into our New York Fashion Week review I'm excited I feel enthralled so let's start off with something a little bit light-hearted Christian Siriano's career by now we all understand that Christian Siriano's fashion career is a joke it's a good one I really enjoy it which sounds really harsh, but also like it's the truth. I'm so sorry. The designer is known for his time on Project Runway and his dressing of plus size and queer celebrities on the red carpet. But I choose to celebrate those things when they are happening, not during a terribly designed and constructed fashion show. The show this season was funded by the Birds of Prey movie, which is probably the newest thing about this collection. Most independent brands have sponsors for their shows, so that's not really new, but to have a movie advertising during a fashion show is something that I've never heard of. And it also seems like it's the only new thing Christian Siriano has ever come up with. The collection started off with a sheer and black striped pair of pants with cutaway silver jacket. Then we got a romper with confetti fringe coat meant to be a reference back to Harley Quinn's costume from the movie, I presume. But somehow the fashion designer's version looks more like Party City than the costume designer's version in the movie. Somebody explain. Siriano also uses the ugliest, cheapest spandex with some sort of glitter woven in, which truly hurts my soul. And honestly, I'm just not talking about the rest of the collection. It was a waste. You understand that now. Let's move on to brighter pastures. Peter Doe. Now, getting to spend time with the clothes that are made by Peter Doe and his team is truly a privilege. Now, you'll note there is no fashion show, and it's because Peter Doe does not doe a fashion show he doesn't feel the need and it's like listen the lookbooks look great so i don't need a show i can just look at the clothes it's fine so i went to the press preview and when i arrived at the building where the showroom was situated we did have a momentary elevator situation but the anticipation helped make the experience even sweeter. Peter wanted to focus on horror movies as inspiration this season, which I know for a fact is something he truly loves. The collection was full of color, starting with muted grays, which is a mainstay for the brand. Then there were beautiful wool jackets, raw edge lapel-less blazers, pleated skirts, and flare pants, which are a reference back to the glory days of the horror movies of the 1970s. With the shrug trend taking off for fall 2020, the rib knit version by Doe was actually nice to see, and the fact that they came in an array of colors was also kind of cute. I'll be honest, I actually bought two crop sweaters this season, but the highlight to me is the fact that they have a juxtaposing colored line running from the turtleneck down to the end of the sleeve, which is a reference back to Doe himself. The designer, whose photo you very rarely see, has a black line tattooed from his right arm below his ear down to his wrist. That is a designer signature if I've ever heard of one. There were lots of reversible shearling pieces, and you all know I'm a slut for shearling, but it really focuses back on the fact that Doe doesn't want to just make clothes and throw them at the customer. He wants them to wear them experiment with them, and have more than just one use for them. His signature spacer textile was turned into pleated skirts and tops, and he also added sequins into the mix. Unfortunately, not even Peter can get me to love them. Tolerate, yes. Want to impregnate, no. He also experimented with trench coats, giving the wardrobe classic a modern twist by making the shoulders detachable. Remember what I said about experimentation? I wouldn't say it's the most flattering thing on me, but I just like to see it out in the wild, and I'd like to see if customers actually want to utilize its two-in-one capabilities. There was lots of color blocking from knits in red, white, and pink to knit shrugs and cami tops in blues and black, which I shall soon be in possession of, and in evergreen and mint 
elegant style as well. He also took on short dresses this season. They were mostly A-line and leathers, but there were a few that were in more athletic fabric that were draped interestingly. Again, I'd like to see if they actually look good on a customer rather than a hanger. All in all, if you're looking for a new brand to stan, it's Peter Doe. He doesn't care about the fashion industry's fame and glitz. He'd rather just make clothes that actual people want to wear. And I think that's the kind of designer we should all be following. Next up is Christopher John Rogers. Christopher John Rogers was New York Fashion Week's most anticipated designer. Having previously won the 2019 CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund and getting an amazing cash influx, it wasn't shocking to see Chris provide a show worth talking about. The collection was more or less a reinforcement of the brand's classics, which will be available to shop at sites like net a and 4510, which wasn't a bad thing at all. For established luxury houses, it's fair to expect newness and an exploration of crazy themes and ideas each season. Blame Karl Lagerfeld for that. But for an up-and-coming brand, re-establishing house codes is vital. The opening look of the show was a puffed out orange top and exaggerated skirt full of ruffles. I do wish it had been switched with the second look though, as the two-tier skirt was more dramatic and the pleated top had more energy. Christopher explored color, which is normal for his collections, with yellows that were iridescent, color-blocked styles, or vibrancy on floral prints. One of his signature sharp shoulder suits emerged in black. The shoulders are so ridiculous that they almost look like what a chic linebacker should have worn to play in the Super Bowl. I also think that the neon green turtleneck adds the pop of color that's synonymous with CJR. Wasn't obsessed with the metallic jacquard pieces and it's also made me wonder what kind of textiles sell best for the brand. A chic long ruffle in neon green with a simple flared pant was nice and commercial, which is necessary for a young brand starting out. The Swarovski crystal top and pants, yeah, Yikes. I'm having terrible Bottega Veneta flashbacks. There were a few of these tightly draped pieces, which is new for CJR. It seems he's dropping the ruching from last season and brought in this style. I love the tops as the tighter the drape, the better, but the skirt's looseness loses that edge. Next was an amazing panniered gown in a color described as Baja Blast, which must be a reference to the popular Taco Bell and Mountain Dew drink. Taco Bell plus fashion is something you're only gonna get at New York Fashion Week. The printed looks with crystals to accentuate the motifs was nice and a bit more luxury for Chris. And again, I'd like to see how it does commercially. We got another beautiful linebacker suit, but this time it was in a gorgeous purple. Another suit was stunning in eggplant, but the way the light reflected on it made it look like a highlighted grape purple. The man knows how to play with color. Another great look was a signature dress of CJR's. It was in black purple moiré silk and had that UDP skirt that Christopher likes quite a bit. UDP stands for upside down pair. Then a plethora of neon pink looks arrived, most quite commercial and specifically the last one, which could be a great dress for just about anyone to wear on a regular basis. We got another pannier gown this time in a funky plaid and then a slew of red looks too. One color block suit that had previously been done in the collection was outfitted on Parker Kit Hill here in a gradient of red to maroon. It was schmexy. The rest of the collection suffered as I think it would have been better to end on another variation of the dramatic pannier gowns rather than the gathered strapless gown shown. All in all, it wasn't revolutionary, but I'm happy to see Chris referencing himself and building up a slew of commercial pieces while still giving us a bit of drama. And I hope to see him explore more textiles next season. Brandon Maxwell, well, Brandon Maxwell. It would be hard to not recognize that Brandon Maxwell is trying to be become the next big American brand. Think Tommy, Ralph, Donna, Diane, Carolina, Oscar, and then, well, possibly Brandon. And if that is the trajectory that Brandon wants, then I am here for it. But he needs to actually push himself and his brand to warrant that big time recognition. He started the show with an all black ensemble that was reminiscent of the train crop tops he showed last season. And while it was nice, there wasn't much to it, which can be said about most of the collection. Brandon doesn't weave a storyline together with his clothes. That's an important thing. This season specifically reads like an all American 
catalog, which isn't far off from last season's collection, but there is no pizzazz. I mean, I love that Yasmin Wijnaldum ate this white turtleneck gown, but regardless, are just clothes deserving of a runway show? Why not a lookbook or a little presentation at the local Neiman Marcus or Nordstrom's? The silhouettes stayed matronly, which is usual for Maxwell. Think rich wasp mother of three in her early 50s, but also a woman married to tech bro with two young kids and the newest and chicest baby carriage. Those women need clothing that fits in with their lifestyle of doing nothing extraordinary and falling in with the status quo for fear of being chastised by the other ritzy people whose admiration they so desperately crave. If that's who Maxwell wants to dress, that's fine, but I need a reason to support that. Is there a strong focus on fabrics that are ultra luxe like the row, or a signature cut like McQueen? Or will it always just be denim boiler suits and ripped jeans and gray turtlenecks? I will say, I appreciate the cowboy boot high heels, although the models definitely couldn't walk in them. The menswear literally looked like a Macy's commercial, there's no way around that, and the only time we strayed away from that waspy white mom shopping for a new look for their MAGA rally was towards the end of the collection, when sheer dresses, tops, and skirts appeared. Many were uninspired. But one in a beautiful green showed me that there was a glimmer of hope for the brand. That there was maybe some ooze of creativity that could shine through on a Brandon Maxwell runway. But it was ruined when a beanie clad Bella Hadid showed up in a black cutout gown that assaulted my eyes. In reality, if Brandon Maxwell wants to become a household name like Calvin and Tommy and Donna and the lot, he needs to create beautiful collections that inspire and push his customer to a new height to leave the basicness behind. Brandon's business, I'm sure, is based on commerciality, but that does not mean he must shed creativity. Next, let's do Laquan Smith. I'm sad to say it, but Laquan Smith this season was disappointing. While Laquan is known for his quite bodycon and tight style, which I love and respect, unfortunately there was no storyline to grasp onto and the clothing didn't fill the gap either. He opened the show with a black halter cocktail dress in some sort of wool and then he moved quickly into a slew of brown looks that most definitely focused on the body. And while they were nice and something different for his customer, those clothes you could already purchase anywhere. And they didn't have anything signature Laquan Smith to make them stand out. Then we got a quilted look, which was less than appealing as it read more like student project than established fashion brand. Although it was nice to see that little peep mini skirt that Laquan debuted last season, which could easily become a classic for the brand. I will say the ho bag was superb and honestly was so meta, I laughed out loud. One corset with leg of mutton sleeves just screamed Anthony Vaccarello, Saint Laurent to me, and pairing it with the baggy cargo pants didn't help at all. A puffer version of the quilted look mentioned earlier was nice, and it was good to see Laquan explore the peekaboo mini skirt again. Then multiple models began to come down together, and while it's a great nod back to icons like Versace and Lagerfeld, I think the look should be similar, otherwise it's too hard to focus on just one. Now, Laquan wasn't the only designer to do that this season though. I did love the middle look, as I think that skirt became a signature for the brand, and the high collar and that black crocodile or alligator is sexy. The other leather looks can go back to the Fashion Nova Excellent sample sale. The metallic blue looks in a pant and dress was nice and a new fabric choice for Laquan that I'd like to see explored more. But the real triumphant moment in the collection came when two models wearing sheer cat suits that created Trump Loe body suits appeared. One had sleeves and a deep plunging neckline that accentuated the model's breasts and fell into a bodysuit silhouette that crawled down the model's inner thighs and legs. It was sexy and revealing, but also was powerful and different. It's the kind of thing I want to see more of from Laquan. The other catsuit created a bodysuit style as well, except it had a one shoulder trumple away. But regardless, they were brilliant looks and this is the kind of moment I expect to see multiple models storm the runway together wearing. It was also great on a plus size model, although I'd like to see a bit more experimentation as the style made it look like she had Mickey Mouse ears for boobs. A t-shirt that reads, I don't 
The help, Tony, must be a reference back to Michelle Pfeiffer's line in Scarface. I love his wordplay, but the date and the name of the runway show the t-shirt came from makes it instantly ugly and unfunny. The collection ended with some sheer leather and fur looks, and all I can say is Laquan Smith needs to push himself more. While there were some great moments in the collection, most of it is derivative, and I hope that that can be changed next season. Next up is Oscar de la Renta. Oscar de la Renta showed their collection this season at the New York Public Library, and in reference to Truman Capote's iconic black and white ball from 1966. The party has been described as the party of the decade. I wouldn't go on to describe this Oscar collection as the best of the decade, but that didn't mean it didn't have its moments. The show opened with Bella Hadid in a color blocked ensemble. The wool coat was nice and the textile was explored throughout the collection. And then a model with a silk head wrap pointed to the fact that Oscar might have been reaching for a bit more diversity on the runway this season, which is new and appreciated. I hope that they can hold on to this going forward. I really love the wool coats, jackets and skirts and one black dress with an asymmetrical neckline was superb with a bright red turtleneck popping out from underneath, which was a nod back to Fernando and Laura's own brand, Monse. One black and white tweed look with a green silky top underneath reminded me of a famous Dior by Mark Bowen look shot by Mark Shaw. The collection then took a bit of a bad turn as the layering was strange and the prints just didn't resonate with their florals and vases placed all over pants and jacket. There was a beautiful black velvet velvet dress with a 3D crystallized flower with this gorgeous rounded skirt that felt like a modern take on a crinoline skirt. But it was also absolutely ruined by these gigantic velvet knee-high boots that reminded me of waders, which is the worst way to downgrade an otherwise gorgeous piece. There was a plus-size model on the runway as well who wore a floral high-low gown. It wasn't anything major, but for Oscar to put a plus size model on the runway was. There was a lot of ruffles, moiré, and color blocking. There were some checkerboard dresses in black and white, which must be a reference back to Capote's party. And while I normally can't stand a sequin, one dress which was done to imitate the famous Van Gogh painting Starry Night was quite nice. Throughout the collection, there weren't too many wow gowns, which I thought was just quite disappointing. I feel that we go to Oscar for gowns that are classic, but Laura and Fernando have pushed the envelope in the past, exploring new motifs and styles to uplift their staples. And that didn't seem to happen this season. It was nice to see the sister dresses of Scarlett Johansson's Oscar gown. One felt like a cooler version of Maria Grazia's fringe disaster from her recent haute couture collection, while another felt like a little bit too similar to it. But the black version was striking, and I kind of wish that that had been what was shown on the red carpet. Bella Hadid closed out the show and another one of those modern crinoline dresses in red velvet and added a feather hooded cape. I'd like to have seen that hood a bit more throughout the collection and I also would have loved to see the crinoline mini dresses some more as well. All in all, the collection was not revolutionary whatsoever. And in the future, I hope to see Oscar push themselves a little bit further. Next up is Prabal Gurung. Prabal Gurung delivered a pretty stellar little collection this season. Prabal is usually known for his quite bold prints, interesting men's suiting, and interesting cutout dresses. But this season, his show took place at the iconic New York Rainbow Room, a concert and dinner club that many of the biggest celebrities have attended. It played into Prabal's theme of cherishing the beauty of living and working in New York City. The collection was a real refined and classy affair for Prabal with beautiful suiting, his signature cutout dresses, and lots and lots of feathers. I'll be honest, the view of New York from the top of Rockefeller Center and the champagne didn't really hurt either. The show opened with a white suit with black and white lapels and a single black stripe down the side of the pant legs. It's refined, but Prowl added his signature hint of eccentricism with a gold button that almost looked a bit like a symbol, maybe a reference back to many of the famous concerts that had taken place at the Rainbow Room. There was a black cutout dress piped with silver crystals, not revolutionary, but nice to see from Prabal. Then there was a mint green suit with a white coat with feathers that definitely reminded me of Valentino. But honestly, the way the feathers bounce in real life as the model walked was breathtaking, so like I'm not gonna be offended about it. TBH, being at a fashion show in real life truly is different than just looking at pictures on Vogue runway, I have to say. Then came some asymmetrical draped skirts and tops. One black one was quite interesting. Prabal draped the skirt to one side and added a black bone 
themed corset, but instead of having it be symmetrical, it fell to the same side as the drape. Buyers probably won't want an asymmetrical corset top, but I respect that Prabal doesn't care about that. It seems that it's all about the fashion, rather than what a customer demands. There were some feathered muffs, the hand warmer kind, for those who have something else on the brain. And there was even a beautiful white asymmetrical neckline dress that had little stripes of lace running along it. The asymmetry is not my favorite, but I know it's a part of Prabal's brand DNA. And this season it was far more dressed up and refined, so I actually could enjoy it. There was a ribbed dress with a keyhole cutout and a horizontal ribbed band that accentuated the waist. For some reason, Prabal this season helped me to enjoy everything I otherwise would hate. I think the feather boa added that bit of drama as well. Quite a bit of plaids that were mixed and matched on skirts and suits, but the collection had a momentary lapse when the floral and leopard prints started to be styled and mixed together with feathers. Maybe there is a customer for these mixings and matchings for Prabal, but regardless, it was scary. There were a few skirts layered on pants and dresses that were draped quite boldly. I think it definitely dressed up what normally would be a more casual and street friendly trend. The crystal looks in that awful grid fashion makes me hate Bottega Veneta even more, but the collection wrapped up nicely with a blue pleated gown with a sweetheart neck neckline of sorts. It was ethereal and would easily have customers swooning. I think that should have been the finale look as the black velvet cutout dress was nice, but the blue really shone through. Top hats off to Prabal. He came to dress his woman up this season and that he did. And I hope to see more collections like this in the future. Next up is Marc Jacobs. Every season, Marc Jacobs is the finale to New York Fashion Week and something that fashion fans across the world look forward to. But with New York Fashion Week feeling less than exciting, a lot of pressure has been put on Mark to make it all worth it. And while the public has pressured him to create a fashion show worth watching, the business side of LVMH, the conglomerate that owns a stake in the company, has put pressure on the brand to make money as well. So it seems he stands at a crossroads. And well, his solution was to put on a fashion show with pretty commercial clothes and have a strangely choreographed dance troupe perform simultaneously. In reality, the only people that must have liked it were people trying to secure their invites for next season. The show opened with a gaggle of models in pinks, blues, grays, whites, and blacks in monochromatic outfits carrying scarves that dragged on the ground behind them. They wore tights that matched their shoes and covered them, which was reminiscent of Dimna's Balenciaga, which does make quite a bit of sense. The Marc Jacobs, which is the new diffusion line for the brand, has been styled by Lada Volkova, who is a stylist who was instrumental for Balenciaga's now signature look under Dimna. Then Kaya Gerber emerged while wearing a yellow shearling coat with matching hat. The coat has its own ravines all throughout, creating texture that might have been dismissed had it not been executed in that manner. And its shortness mixed with its A-line silhouette could be a reference back to the 1960s mod style. In reality, the majority of the collection had a very 1960s feel about it, which harkens back to a lot of Jacobs' nostalgia, which has been seen in his own collections, but also from those that made him a household name as the creative director of women's wear for Louis Vuitton. Then there were fitted coats with black panties and bras and a black leather pencil skirt as well. This is where the the collection starts to go a bit strange, but we start to get back on track with two beautiful white dresses filled with seams. One is long sleeved and as the skirt flounced, the seams created shadows adding dimension. The next look was a tighter draped dress with invisible seams on the chest, while the cut was nice. I think that the seams were a little bit much and didn't seem to flatter the body. Next was a light pink fur coat styled over a slip dress and then three slip dresses in different styles followed. One red version created cups for the breast with a little bow in the center and opera gloves was a subtle showstopper. I have to say, Mark's minimal pieces really forced you to focus on his color choices this season. And that crisp red was nice to see. Then there was a beige slit with a square neckline and a blue slip that was similar, except it was accentuated with little white leather gloves. This collection seemed to be so minimal compared to his previous collections in recent years that I have to assume that the company must be looking to be more commercial. And these looks are a perfect example of pieces that could sell. But I wonder if the clientele is actually there and if they are looking to buy into this 1960s look Mark is showing. Then there were knit cardigans.
leggings, see-through crystal dresses, and a black leather skirt set. I did love that black and white 1960s graphic coat, and the baby blue leather coat was nice as well. Then Gigi Hadid appeared in a pencil skirt and coat look that instantly read Prada to me. Now Mark last season referenced the greats like Valentino and Coco Chanel, so him referencing Mucha, who he is very vocal about admiring, would be of no shock to me. The rose petal styles were quite chic and, you know, something honestly I would think about wearing. And the little black and white cape over a nice long black gown was also quite chic and gave us that volume that we love and know from Marc Jacobs. There was a whole lot of suiting, some in nice little A-line cuts, and then others a little bit blah boring and something you could already find on the racks of any of your luxury department stores. There was that horrific silver gown that had the turnt panel of fabric over it. <laughs> we got more sort of Jackie Kennedy style pastel looks. Then we got some weird like Peter Pan collar, sweater, and jean moments as well, which was confusing because it's like, I don't know what is the storyline here. Miley Cyrus showed up in that black and white graphic print dragging along as she's wearing a bra and black pants. And I'm just like, I don't know why Miley Cyrus is on a runway. Somebody explain. You get the limo ride out front, the hottest shoes, every style, every color from Marc Jacobs, which in reality at this point, eh. There were some reflective sheer styles, which just felt blah. And this like glitter tinsel dress and gown as well, which were kind of interesting. And the collection followed out with an off the shoulder black high low gown. Carly Kloss in this white sweater and skirt set and a sort of pink and blue opera coat and dress combo situation. All in all, I just wasn't really understanding the Marc Jacobs vibe this season. Like who knows? Who cares? What is the point of all of this? If Marc Jacobs can't finish off New York Fashion Week strong, well, what are we all to do? That is the end of our New York Fashion Week review. I hope you guys enjoyed and please stay tuned because London, Milan, and Paris will be coming separately, but coming nonetheless. So thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you guys in the next video and TTYL.